everybody. Hi to our panelists and hi to everybody that's joining us. Hi, Don from Denton. Um, feel free to type into the chat window um, where you're calling in from and um, maybe even where you saw the eclipse. Make sure to put the two uh, field to all panelists and attendees so we can talk to each other. Oops. All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone. This is the wrap up webinar for the Eclipse Mega Movie Project and uh, we will be giving you an overview of how we did. Spoiler alert, alert. we did fantastic. <laughs> it's been a really amazing project and we have a lot of the team here tonight to talk with you and um, tell us about what's going on, uh, what the data we got and what the future of the science is going to look like. So I want to introduce them now. We've got Drs. Laura Petacolis with us, uh, Brian Mendez, Dr. Brian Mendez, Dr. Hugh Hudson, all from UC Berkeley. And I think we'll be joined in a little bit by Dr. Juan Carlos Martinez Oliveros. And they're going to tell us a lot about the science and what's going to happen next with all of this data. We've also got Calvin Johnson joining us from Google. Hi, Calvin. And he's going to let us know about the image database and some statistics from the project and what the next steps are um, there. And then I am Vivian White, and I'm joined by Brian Cruz. We're both from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco. And Brian has something quick to share with you. Um, some housekeeping details. Hi, Brian. Hi, Vivian. Thank you very much. And so I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, just a couple of little housekeeping details um, in the chat window. If you want everyone to see your message, you need to go to the little blue button down at the very bottom of the chat window, click on that and find where it says all attendees and panelists. Actually, I think it's all panelists and attendees. Make sure it says that or if you don't do that, only the panelists are gonna see what you're saying and I think everyone would like to hear from you. Also, if you have any questions during, for our panelists during the webinar, please type those into the Q&A and also uh, keep any general comments in the chat window uh, and only put your questions into the Q&A. If you put your questions into the chat window, we'll lose track of them. Um, and so we'll be able to find them much easier if you put those into the Q&A. And other than that, I think we're good to go. Great, thanks Brian. There's gonna be time at the end of this presentation for questions and feedback from you all. So stay tuned for that. And I just wanted to say thank you all so very much. There has been, there's still so much discussion going on. And I am just back from two weeks away from technology and I'm catching up on the forum now. So expect some answers very soon to some of those questions you have. This will be recorded and uh, posted on the forum. So you can find it in the Google groups afterwards. Uh, first and foremost, the swag. I have my list of things to talk to you about. The swag is top at on that list. We are packing up the very last of the two, we, we've got the last 200 of those packages going out and they should be going out on Monday. So keep an eye out. Uh, they should be coming to you who have posted images, uh, either test images or images of the eclipse uh, totality. So keep an eye out for those. You know, one thing I, I would like to mention, Vivian, is that a lot of people were wondering where the swag was. And some people were indicating that it arrived last week, but we mailed it out the very first week of September. And so it took a long time to get there. And so don't be surprised. It's not that uh, it's probably not that we've neglected you. It's probably just a slow mail. Yeah, that's true. And you'll get just one swag package. Most of you will get just one swag package. Um, uh, if you got the hat, the big package in the beginning, you won't get another follow-up pin. It's the same exact pin that they're getting. Um, the people who did not test their pictures out before the date, they won't be able to get the hat just because we didn't have enough of them. So if you tested your pictures out before the final date of testing, then you got the hat. And I hope you have all gotten that part by now, um, who were supposed to get it. One other thing you might want to check out, and Brian, help me out with this too. If you log into EclipseMega.movie and you go to your profile, you will find a certificate. 
that you can print out. This is a certificate. It's got a couple, well, depending on what you did, it's got some badges telling about your contributions to the project. So make sure to check that out when this webinar is over and um, feel free to print it out and stick it on your fridge. That's what I was going to do. This has been a most incredible project. And I just, again, I want to thank you all for participating. I can't believe how many people actually took the time and learned oftentimes for the first time how to photograph an eclipse. And uh, I know that this has been a, uh, a unifying experience for a lot of the U.S. and including people who came here uh, to visit and see the eclipse. So I am thrilled at all of the connections that have been made. I know that I personally have just enjoyed interacting with all of you in the forum, um, in the socials that we had. Those were way more fun than I was expecting. You guys have been fabulous. And we even got to meet some of you in person. So thanks for coming out. I love the community and the experience. And I really look forward to seeing what happens as we go forward. Um, so at some point, this group, the Google group, is going to go into hibernation. And uh, I'm not sure when that's going to happen yet, but we'll let you know. There has been talk of creating a new group for working on the science, so keep an eye out. We'll post some more about that in the forum, and we'll put announcements out as that comes up, and so you can find that at any point. Uh, and you'll learn more about that in the talk coming up. There are some pieces of this that are gonna go forward and make future eclipses even better. We've got, uh, we've created this template now for how to train and engage and recruit hundreds of volunteers for something like this. So we plan to use it again for 2024 and maybe even try it out again before that with any luck. Um, I think Hugh might have something to say about that. I haven't checked in, but I <laughs> mentioned what we might or might not do for the 2019 eclipse. If anyone's going down to Chile, keep us posted or Argentina in 2019, let us know. And uh, maybe we'll try it out in Spanish. Or maybe even 2020 in Argentina. Or 2020. They have uh, great beaches there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now I just want to turn it over to Laura and Calvin. If you guys want to take it away and tell us what is coming up next, we're thrilled to hear. Okay, I'll start. And I'm going <clears> to <throat> clear my throat first, apparently. Um, I am going to show you a um, some slides here. So I'm going to share this, my screen, which for many of you, I think will might mean that suddenly your screen's going to be taken over by the Zoom. Um, if you want to have it then kind of go back into a dialog box, you can hit escape on your keyboard or up on the top right hand screen, uh, there is a speaker view, um, or no, there's a little button that you can click. It's a toggle button. It says exit full screen. <coughs> really having trouble with my throat, sorry. I think it's fine now. Okay, so here I go. I'm gonna share. And so right now you should just see um, that I have a reminder about this Zoom. I'll say I know about that. And I'm gonna bring this over. And here's our presentation we've been working on. And I'm going to play this. Okay, so I hope that you all can see that. Um, Vivian, can you see it? You probably muted yourself. Yep. Okay, thank you. okay good. Thank you. I just needed yeah, some confirmation. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'm going to go through the slide. I'll take just a minute to go through it. And um, so this is kind of a, it represents our work that we've been doing, what we did in the past, uh, currently are doing in the future overview. So, and I put it in the context of scientific process, practices. And there, if, if any of you are educators or just interested in what is science, there's a really nice um, document that I've, I've, uh, referred to here in the bottom and uh, this document kind of shows 
it describes a lot of the practices that scientists and engineers go through and it, it separates uh, where there's a difference between science and engineering what that is and it's used in it's it's about to be used in a lot of um, element uh, high school middle school and elementary schools during the uh, during science classes so that students aren't just getting science facts but they're also learning about what is science and i find it very useful not just for that audience but when i'm talking to even scientists about what we do <laughs> what do we do um so i thought well it'd be fun to put kind of this whole project in the context of the scientific endeavor so we really started off here at the top left ask a question um, and we, we were really interested to know well, how will mo more solar atmospheric density data help our understanding of the sun so these images that you took of the corona it really gives us a great uh, approximation of the density it, it's called line of sight density because you're you're basically taking a three-dimensional object and just looking at it in two dimensions so you can imagine looking at a cloud uh, well a cloud's not a good uh, example maybe a kind of translucent uh, curtains and when you fold them up you could you 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 see many folds um, but you're just looking at it in two dimensions and so you would you can kind of um, see how how many folds you have so it's similar with the corona that you're just looking at it in two dimensions but it's really this three-dimensional object and the nice thing about the white light corona that you all took photographs of is that it, it gives us pretty good understanding of the density um, along that what's called line of sight which just means you can um, flatten it into the two dimensions okay hopefully that was kind of understandable um, okay so we wanted to know like if we get more of this data how is that going to help our understanding of the sun and this pl we plan this investigation wrote and published the eclipse mega movie white paper if you haven't seen that yet uh, hugh hudson led that um, who's here today with us and you can go find it it's linked to our website um, and we think we've done most everything we said we were going to do in that in that paper so that was um, exciting but before we got here to today we did do a little test investigation and we gathered images from the 2012 eclipse and that's where we first created the algorithm for making the movie that you're that you've been seeing kind of evolve over time um, but what we only ended up accumulating images from maybe five or ten different people and then we had to go out and kind of try to hunt down more images and we simply didn't have the number of images that we were hoping to get and we realized we really needed a better plan for engaging the public um, and to contribute to this so we revised our investigation plan by including the volunteer photographer idea that's you all <laughs> and also we did an eclipse tour so that we could um, recruit for these for, for volunteers uh, along the path um, so some of you may have seen me or Darlene or Calvin or Mark Bender who's also on the call um, or who else Chris Chaston uh, Chris Cable was also on that tour um, and then we also had a lot of press articles out and I think some of you had read some of the articles in Sky and Telescope and others so that our plan kind of changed to focus more on getting the word out and to, to people about wanting these um, images and also realizing that we we're going to need to train some folks uh, to do it so then we carried out the investigation as you know you all were a part of that we uh, you you got excited about the project thank you very much and we're so excited that you did and um, it's been so heartening to see all your comments and and you know the, yes it wasn't perfect it's the first time we've ever done this so uh, as research is it's usually kind of messy because <laughs> things don't go as planned um, but we did carry out the investigation and it, it, we consider it a big success as Calvin will show on the next slide um, because it, in a large part because of your efforts frankly truly uh, we developed the website and an app uh, and we collected the photographs that you so uh, wonderfully went and uploaded in your various places so we are now um, working on this analyze and interpret data practice of science so a lot I've seen in the public forum some people saying so where's the science what have you discovered yet and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing uh, to to try to find some discoveries here uh, but 
part of that is to make the photos ready. So Calvin will talk a little bit more about that too for, for everyone to have access to um, and to analyze the photos with other data. So we've been looking at some NASA um, data of the sun during this time. And again, Juan and I will show that a little bit later. And we'll continue to do that um, for the next really till 2020, I would imagine, and maybe beyond. Uh, so this is a part of the scientific practice that will continue, and more scientists in the country will, once these images are available, they will, uh, the, I'm sure they will grab, there will be scientists who want to use these photographs as well, other ones that aren't part of our team. Uh, and then we go into this um, part of the project where we will be constructing explanations for what we see. So we are starting to see different uh, features in the corona and we're gonna we're starting to look at what we already know about the sun and um, if those already if those can explain what we see or are there new explanations that need to be made uh, we are talking to our colleagues that have um, wonderful computer models that take the physics of the sun and turn them into uh, turn them into models that we can um, get provide observations into and then they the models will run and provide basically um, what the sun, what we would expect the Sun to do and then if that's different from what we observed then we know that the model is wrong and we have to figure out what physics in the model is not included in the model or how the physics is um, maybe one parameter of the physics is being is dominating in the model but it shouldn't but in in reality in the sun it's not dominating so those are the things we do with models uh, and computers and math um, those are really mathematical equations we're using and then we're going to be communicating all these results we're going to communicate them to you we'll go to our scientific conferences and communicate them with our, our science peers and get feedback from them um, and we'll also be writing papers and again in the paper writing process uh, our peers will be critiquing our analyses and interpretation and explanations until they are satisfied that what we've done is correct um, and then it would get published so that kind of gives you a sense of this project and the, the scientific, uh, from a scientific perspective. All right, Calvin, you're up next. Hello. Uh, all right, so I wanted to share a few stats uh, for the, the final data set that, we've, uh, that we're actively pulling together. Um, so we recruited about 1,400 people into the photo team. Uh, and then almost 600 of you uh, took or ma uh, managed to take photos and submit them, submit them to the project. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We are so excited with the uh, numbers that we got. We've got fantastic density sort of all across the path of totality. So it's just great. Um, and you submitted uh, 44,000 photos and 657 gigs. So it's, it's this fantastic data set that we're really excited to sort of share with the world and uh, the scientific community. Uh, so thank you all for participating in this. Um, Laura, do you want to pop to the next slide? I do. Um, so if you haven't seen it yet, please do check out the latest uh, Mega Movie video, which is on the uh, EclipseMega.movie website. Uh, that's where we post the latest all the time. So we're on V0.7 uh, now. Um, and so I wanted to sort of share an update on sort of how we generated this video, um, as well as sort of talk about some of the sort of weirdness about it and uh, talk about sort of what we're doing next. Um, so you'll notice that as you're watching this video, there's a lot of sort of funny things. Um, so th this one is comprised of 5,000 unique photos that passed a series of tests. So we, we tested to see if it had an accurate GPS location, it had an accurate timestamp, and that those two put it sort of in totality where we expected it to be. Um, from there, we then put them all in the right order and found the circle in each image to sort of resize and center each image that might be a slightly different zoom or a slightly different uh, sort of uh, orientation in the, the picture uh, to sort of smooth it out as much as possible. Um, you'll notice that there are there's flickering between different exposure levels and the rotation of images is sort of inconsistent. Uh, and then we also have a fair number of blurry images in there. Uh, and so the reason we have those um, is just sort of how we, how we um, produced this video. So uh, initially when we were starting sort of a few years ago, we, we thought, you know, this will be perfect for machine learning. We'll do all this cool AI stuff. It'll be all cutting edge. Uh, it turns out you need a existing data set to make that work. So similar to what Laura was saying about the, the last, when they tested this, they had a, you know, a half a dozen sites that, that took photos. Um, 
that was all that we had going into this. And so we, we really couldn't uh, build the machine learning tools necessary to use the uh, elements within the photo uh, to sort of do alignments and things like that. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so um, for future uh, projects, we now have this incredibly rich data set. So we, we now have uh, methods of building some of these machine learning tools. So that opens up opportunities like using Regulus and the, the stars that you see in some of these photos, using the sort of structure of the corona to align the image and things like that. Um, as well as sort of, uh, you could even train, I'm not an expert in this, I believe you could train a model on finding sort of the quality images as well. So say ignore the blurry ones, grab the good ones, um, that sort of thing is now within reach because we've got this data set that you all helped create. Uh, so we're really excited that, that we can sort of take it to the, the next level here. Um, and so in terms of what's next, um, we're, we're working on open sourcing and uh, publishing the data set next. Uh, so we're going through and making sure that there's no um, accidental sort of personal information included in the data set. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so we're, we're going through, we're cleaning up the data set, getting it ready to publish. We're hoping to put it out publicly next week. Uh, sort of mid next week if everything goes according to plan. Uh, it'll be on a site called uh, Google Cloud Open Datasets uh, where anyone can get at it and uh, our scientific folks on this uh, call can start getting into some of the, the fun stuff that they're looking to do. Um, let's see, I think I got all of those things. Should I check the Q&A? Is that, uh... oh no, we'll do that later. Vivian's shaking her head. Okay, we'll do that later. Um, we'll do the Q&A at the end. Okay, gotcha. Um, if anybody has questions, make sure to add them to the Q&A and we'll get to them. Yes, add questions. Happy to talk about how we, how we made the algorithm or any other questions that you might have. But uh, thank you again for all of your photos. It's truly fantastic. We're really excited with both what we were able to do and what we can do in the future. Uh, so now I'll pass it over to uh, Laura and Juan to talk about sort of what, what the uh, science is going to be. Okay, Juan, you are up. Okay, so the basic idea that we have, as already Calvin said, for what we want to do is to use your images to start seeing the structures in the corona. Juan, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, interrupt you for just a minute. Can you make yourself a little louder? I don't know how to do that. No, it's better. It's a little better. Yeah. A little better. Okay. It's that better. Oh my gosh! So much. But, but then you disappeared. It was so much better and now you're gone. <laughs> oh, I hear you again. Now you hear me better? Yes, that is perfect, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay. So as, as Laura and Calvin said, the, the plan is to use all the images that you provide us for science. And the first thing that we need to do or is, is to try to find the structures in the corona that are somewhere hidden in the images that you sent. As Calvin pointed out, the first thing is to try to find where the sun is, or the moon in this case. So for that, we did this data processing that is very simple at this point, it's very simplistic, in which we try to find the center of the disk using a special fit. So you have here in the, in the first image that you see, is how we obtain the center. From there, we can use another algorithm to try to clean up the signature. So you have here three examples from two DSLR cameras and one iPhone, in which the original image, but you can see the corona, but not much structures. And using this algorithm, you start seeing stuff like coronal jets, uh, yeah, coronal jets or plumes, and you can see the streamers very well and the structures inside the streamer. You can see that data structures are the same in the different kind of data that we have for this example that are just three images. Other thing that we need to do is astrometric calibration of the data. So that's the other image that you can see. And that little tiny circle in, that you get close to the sun with one little dot, it's uh, regulus. But you can clearly see that the fit is not working at this point. That means that we need to change something in our algorithm. But the idea is to do that. And I think that's, that's all for me, for me. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Calvin. So um, I will talk a little bit about the possible science that we're exploring now um, with some of the images. So I grabbed one of these images that Juan uh, created using the second step uh, normalization here, the apply a Gaussian normalization algorithm. Uh, and some of you use, for example, yeah. So I, I grabbed that because what's really nice about this image that you know, was taken at 1717 UT, so maybe it was one of yours. Um, it was near the coast of Oregon. And um, at this time, you can see these structures that Juan was talking about, these streamers um, and coronal structure. And what's what a lot of solar scientists study is this global corona. It evolves somewhat slowly. Uh, over time, and there's especially an interesting 11-year cycle of this um, global corona that occurs as sunspots increase over time and decrease over time over an 11-year cycle, approximately. Um, and when there are a lot of sunspots, it's known as solar maximum, and when there are few sunspots, it's known as solar minimum, and the corona changes um, considerably uh, when it when there are a lot of sunspots, um, you you get a lot more structure in the corona, a lot more um, different. Like here, you're seeing some interesting structure down below, um, and over here. But during a quiet sun, you'll just generally have some of these larger coronal loops, uh, maybe just two of them, in fact. So we're really interested to kind of understand that structure and how it propagates out in space, how it gets set up, uh, what it looks like in three dimensions, and then kind of flattened into this two-dimension view that we see. So because the, the path of totality was this nice 93 minutes, um, and you all took photographs across that entire path. Well, what's really nice is that um, there was a little bit of rotation of this global corona during that time. And um, so we might be able to actually detect how the three, we might actually be able to reconstruct a little bit of the three dimensions of the corona um, from that, because of that, uh, from, because of that difference basically from Oregon all the way to, uh, in images from Oregon to South Carolina. The other thing that we're looking for is um, there's there's some really interesting ways that the sun it, um, has energy leaving its surface, so it's not just glowing uh, in this light, light that provides us our life, <laughs> basically, but it also uh, emits, um, has these uh, waves of energy that propagate out from the surface of the, what's called the surface of the sun or the photosphere. And those waves are energy waves and um, can contribute to some interesting dynamics in this global corona. And we don't really understand how some of that energy, how the if you think of waves in an ocean, you can have waves going on the surface or you can have waves um, that go deeper into the ocean. And you can have many different types of waves through, through the ocean and the same is with the sun. And so what can happen is if you hit, just like when a wave in an ocean hits the beach, it changes kind of, it, it does what we call a, a mode conversion in the wave. So you might have a, a surface wave on the surface of the ocean and it hits the beach and it, it kind of rises the entire uh, ocean up there on the beach and creates some nice waves for us to surf with. So the same kind of, well, not the same mode conversion, but you can have plasma waves that do these mode conversions, which are not really well understood yet. And there's some arguments about um, how that happens. So we're hoping to, uh, we're gonna be looking for some of those waves to be propagating through the corona in your images. Uh, also there's matter, so flows that, like basically matter gets ejected off of the sun and we're gonna look at that as well, look for some of those things. So we haven't found these yet because we're still um, just trying to get access to the data as well as uh, just refine these algorithms that Juan talked about. Okay, I'm gonna give it this pointer. Uh, we also want to understand better about the size of the sun. The sun changes its size over time. Um, it 
basically goes through seismology just like earth does the, the, the big seismic events which changes its size um, and Hugh can talk more about the size changing and I'll just say before that um, that these these Bailey beads that we uh, captured using the iPhone app or the Android apps um, on the on the smartphones uh, they because we know ex we know down to meters the size of the moon uh, we will be able to use the this this light coming from this the photosphere of the Sun um, around the entire so what I did is we have this black box which is uh, an image and these bright dots are these Bailey's beads and then I put a circle around just a rough circle to represent this the moon um, where the moon is found so here you can see these these beads peaking uh, the photosphere peaking around the moon's uh, craters and mountains and uh, so we can take that emission and, and determine the size of the Sun if we have enough of those around the entire moon um, yeah entire moon oh, Hugh do you want to say any additional things about the size of the Sun the size of the sun is a very, very interesting scientifically, and it's something that we uh, uh, can get at with uh, not only with the with the nice photography, but also just with the timing from the iPhone to the smartphones. Juan showed you the an image, of, uh, one image from a smartphone. Well, not all of them are quite that good, but they show these Bailey's beads extremely well because the the intensity of the light is so great, and so the precise timing that came from these smartphone images uh, because they had GPS access to GPS down at the millisecond level. So very, very precise is exactly what you need to make a, a fundamental physical measurement, which is the radius size of the sun. And not only the size of the sun, but the shape of the sun. And not only the size and shape of the sun, this, I know this sounds kind of uh, exotic and boring, but it's really important. Uh, not only the size and the shape, but also the time variation of the of the location of the surface of the sun, kind of like the sea level rising and falling, sometimes dangerously. Uh, this is the nature nature of the surface of the sun as well. And by watching those variations, it's another uh, channel by which we can see kind of see in, into the interior of the sun where activity is originally being formed. So that's kind of the reason that we did the app uh, photography. And uh, to add to uh, the uh, 800 gigabytes that Calvin mentioned, we got a couple of hundred gigabytes, maybe 50 or 60,000 images from the app in this eclipse. And that's a, a rich data source, the likes of which has never been seen before. And so I'm sure that uh, many people, including Xavier Jubier, who did the software, the Eclipse Maestro software that many of you used for the photography. Uh, he's quite interested in this radius problem. And so he will be among the people who are going to be analyzing uh, the whole ensemble of data, uh, images, photography, as well as the GPS timing in the smartphone data. So that's basically the story uh, on that side. Great. Thank you, Hugh. And then um, we wanted to just mention to you all that we that during when during the total solar eclipse we had two phenomenal what we call transient events from the sun and so you might have remembered when we uh, in one of these webinars we said well if there's a coronal mass ejection um, that would be amazing because then we would be able to see how it propagates through this through space and contribute to um, to science uh, in that way, because some of the images that NASA gets uh, doesn't go all the way down to the to the photosphere, and it doesn't they don't see the chromosphere. And so here, indeed, we had a coronal mass ejection. Um, this is a picture of the CME, this coronal mass ejection coming off the sun. And this, I believe, Juan, I took this from Scott McIntosh's image that he emailed us. Um, but this was this is a space-based image, correct? Right, that's Lefko. Yeah. Right, and the key thing about this image is that the black uh, circle there is much much bigger than the black than the, uh, the size of the sun. It's the uh, culting disk of the coronagraph. So the photography from the Mega Movie photographers is inside, if you can, uh, an annulus, 
in, inside that radius. And Juan, what is, the, what is the radius of that black circle? It's about 1.6, isn't it? Of the C2? This is I C2, yeah. Like 10, yeah, I think it's like five fourths of the radius. Okay, that's, so that's- It's a lot, it's big. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's like two, yes. But in any case, there's lots of real estate in the black uh, that they can't see, but we can, ha ha. So we'll be able to watch this CMB uh, starting out basically at the surface of the sun. Yeah, and uh, so just to let people know, this was at 1724 UT, which is, um, and this image is taken at the time when the totality was happening uh, just northeast of John Day, Oregon. So um, for those of you who were in Oregon, that's really when the CME started uh, to propagate. In fact, it, I think it was 1717, or no, 1715, when it first uh, came off the sun. And so for those of you who t took images in Oregon, it's really gonna be crucial um, for, the, for the coronal mass ejection studies. Uh, and then we also had a flare. Uh, which is a, f um, so the coronal mass ejections are really a bunch of the matter coming off of the sun and flares is predominantly, there's also matter that comes off of flares, but it's predominantly seen in or observed um, through light observations. So this is a image from uh, a, sol a camera out in space, a NASA camera out in space, and you can see this, what we call a flare here. It flared up in, um, uh, this is 1600 angstroms, is that right? Juan? Right. That's 1600 yeah. angstrom. Yeah. yeah. That's ultraviolet. Yeah. So we have this flare in ultraviolet, and that happened in around 1747 to 50, and that is right on the border between Wyoming and Nebraska. So for those of you um, in Nebraska who took photographs, we're going to be looking for. Um, uh, any kind of signatures that happened after this flare that we would maybe see in the corona as a, as a um, uh, that might have represented some of the processes that would have happened during this flare. So here's another a more extreme ultraviolet image um, of the sun, of the flare. So here you can see there's um, a brighter, the whiter means brighter. Uh, so more energy coming up. And this is um, even more energetic. And then this is really energetic. And so what this is, is if we look at this image, you can see this is the edge. Oh, here, let me get the pointer here. This is the edge of the sun right here. So I didn't kind of point that out. And these are these loops coming off of the sun as the flare in the really energetic, right, part of the flare. And then what we're, I'm gonna about to show you is, a, a, you'll see again kind of the edge of the sun in this image but um the rest of, but it's more zoomed in so here's that edge and it's just put there uh by the kind of algorithm by the resi team and then this is this very bright um uh, bright emission coming off of the sun and now since juan is a integral part of the resi team the nasa resi team you want to tell us what this this is x-rays is that right Yes, that's X-ray, like soft X-ray, that is more thermal emission coming. It's heated plasma, is what it means. It was not very energetic, this little tiny flare. Okay, it's very heated plasma, all right. Okay, and then Juan, do you have the coronal mass ejection movie or should we uh, do that another time? Yes, I did, I think I'd include it. Uh, Laura, if you X, X out of present mode and then relaunch present, it should it should work. Okay. Okay, I've done that, and let me try again. Oh, right. This is a nice thing about, I need to request access. Did you? Juan, it well, looks like you may need to share it. I need to share? Yeah, I just asked you permission to show it. 
Or one, if you want, you can share your screen and show it. Yeah, why don't we do that? I'm going to stop my, sh my screen share. How I do share? You go down to the bottom, there's a little green um, rectangle. Rec yep. Rectangle. Rectangle. Then you can just uh, select which one you want to share. The, the desk, desktop is most reliable. Okay. You like share? That? Yep, just like that. Just like that. Just like that, yep. And then on the right, over by Calvin's Calvin, then you'll see present, yep. So hopefully it does work. It yeah. works. So far, so good. Yes, very nice. It's going. So you can see here the CME. It's, it's kind of this is the range that we got with, this, with the Mega Movie. And that black thing in between the the Lasco and the Sun. And then you can see the, the CME popping up. So it's kind of that small flow that you see at the end of of the movie. In here, oh, I need a, I need a pointer. There's a little pointer yeah. at the bottom. You'll, yeah. uh, but you cannot see the pointer in the movie. Well, we can see your, uh, we we can see your mouse actually. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so you can see it in here. First, you see the flags, and then you're going to see something coming up. No. We're seeing it. Mm -hmm. Juan, what's the flash from? Is that just? What's the what's the what? Flash. The flash? What's making that flash? I can't what's see. The flash? This, this one in here? Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry. The one right next to the sun. This one? Yes. So these are our flags from another instrument saying that there was a CME with a certain velocity at that point measure. Got it, got it. Okay, you guys, I wanna make sure to have time for questions at the end, so if we can wrap it up in maybe five more minutes and leave time to answer some of these great questions we're getting. <coughs> Is that possible? Oh yeah, no, that was our last slide. No kidding. Oh, <laughs> that was a really good ending. That was <laughs> wow. <laughs> Fabulous. So possible. <laughs> Man, I should ask for more things. Um, that's great, you guys. I cannot wait to see how lucky that we had two transient events happen during that short eclipse, during that 90 minutes. That's incredible. Um, I don't think we expected really one, not certainly not both of those. How cool. Uh, we have great questions from everybody. Uh, if anyone wants to add questions, uh, there's a and a I think most people can find it at the bottom of their screen. If you click on there, you can add a question. And um, Phil asked a question about um, if the algorithm is going to normalize the color temperatures of the photos in future versions of the movie. Did you want to take that on, Hugh? Was that something? Oh, did we lose? No, there it is. Yes, yes, I can make an ad hoc comment about that. The uh, color temperature uh, is a the temper the, the color, of course, is artificial because it's a it's photography and it's not a, a precise measure of the true color of the sun uh, or the corona. But the brightness is, a, is an important thing. And so the brightness in any one of these images uh, is going to change. Uh, it's going to be different from the brightness in some other image because a different camera was being used and a different uh, focal, focal length and exposure time and all of that. So what we have to do is flatten these images together, smash them together, uh, equalize their histograms, if that's the technical term, Photoshop them, uh, but not in such a way as to lose information, but to make it possible to make differences between one image and the next. And by doing that kind of thing, this is related to the kinds of sharpening that, that Juan showed earlier on. By doing that, uh, we can see subtle changes, and uh, the better we succeed at that, and this is going to be where a lot of hands-on work is going to be required from people uh, getting into the archive of images, the better we can do that, the more we can discover. 
So that's uh, roughly the idea. Great. Yeah, just just to add a little more to that, so the the algorithm that uh, put out the mega movies that we have right now was was designed to be very hands off with human touch. But this, yeah, as he was saying, this is one of the things that uh, now that well, the full data set is there and people can sort of do the hand tweaking of the, the images and, and then throw them back through the, uh, the algorithm. Uh, that's, yeah, an area where it can improve. Hey, Calvin, while we're on you right now, uh, Mark asked a question about the algorithm a while ago. He said, how did the algorithm pick the exposures in the movie? Right. Um, so... That was one that you'll you'll notice through sort of the version iterations they got better and better. We had a few different approaches in those that window that we sort of tweaked in the days after the eclipse. Um, at first, we were taking the images closest to the center line, which turned out not to be a great metric of image quality. Uh, it's just sort of a, a grab bag, no matter what you get. Um, and so after that, we just um, since the algorithm can't really doesn't identify aspects within the photo that make it good. Um, we adjusted it so that any one image was only shown for a few frames. So because we had so many people submitting images, we had the density where we could show all of them. Uh, and so it was, we, we, we opted to show all of them since we couldn't select the best one at any given time. Cool. Kind of along those lines, um, Alan and Vanessa and some others were asking about are edited images with contrast adjustments and such, are those of any use to the science community? Um, a lot of our participants are more photographers than astronomers, and this is their, this is what they're really good at. So would that help at all? So maybe I can, um, so there are a couple parts to analyzing this data. There's, um, as you saw from our slideshow, so it depends on what part of the analysis that we're talking about. Um, if we're really looking, for example, for potential features in the corona or chromosphere that are correlated with that flare that occurred, then we don't know necessarily what that's going to look like. Um, I mean, we have maybe some guesses, but it could be that some artistic <laughs> renditions and some Druckmeyer type of an editing or just pulling out different features with your own, you know, just really from an artistic perspective could be very helpful because it may might allow us to uh, see things that we wouldn't see otherwise. And then what we can do is take the raw data and do some very specific algorithm um, manipulation of the image so that we really understand what those uh, features are. For example, I know some of you took darks and light, uh, darks and flats, um, and we can we can start to do some use some of those to get calibrated data from some of your images, and then we can apply that to some of the others. So we can then get brightness uh, as a better like a, a pretty good sense of the brightness and then from that if you've done some artistic or editing of your images and found some features we can kind of go through that process then the scientific process to see are those are those there and actually cor correlated with the with the cme or other waves that might be coming off the sun so that's um i would say yes but probably in a different way than you would expect and probably we'll have, yeah, that's great. And probably we'll have to wait for a little while before we ask for those because they're going to be in a different pile than um, the ones that we have already uploaded. So, yeah, so a, a few people have asked sort of how would I give those to you? Uh, right. We, that's something that we would need to sort out. We've, as you may have seen, if you've gone to the website uh, recently, we've turned off the upload functionality. That was just so that we could make sure that we were packaging up the full data set. Um, in, in one sort of bundle before putting it out. Um, we've talked a lot about sort of how we can get images uh, in the future and it's something we're still sort of working on. Um, but for now, I think we've, we've got a fantastic set of scientifically valuable stuff. Yeah, so take your time. <laughs> um, I, do I think showing them, sharing them in the group, right, is still really been, been helpful. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of those that are shared in the group, so maybe that's a good way to do that in the meantime. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
So kind of related to the questions about the database, there are a couple of really good questions. Um, Frank, uh, actually Vince says, uh, how are you going to be going about searching for images in there? You know, if, you're, if there's a transient event, you have this very large database, how are you gonna go look for the images that were right there around that time? Um, Hugh or Juan, do you wanna to talk to that? I mean. We could talk about the metadata and the timestamps. Yeah. The... yeah, I think I think the the metadata, or the circumstances of every image, uh, is spelled out in a a, a table that's accessible uh, in a search system. So I'm hoping that they will will have a simple web based uh, search capability, so that one can uh, dive in to the right moment at the right time for the right kind of image and and, get, and be very precise about that in a, a user friendly sort of way. So I think Calvin probably knows more about this than I do, but that's my, that's my anticipation in any case. Yeah, so the, the, the system that we've got is called BigQuery. It's, uh, it's user-friendly if you know SQL. Uh, if not, um, we, it, it gets a little complicated, but we, we'll put together some sort of sample language that goes on the site that's like how to, how to use SQL for a few specific things. Um, but it will be queryable based on the, the metadata uh, as he was describing. Great. Um, and there were a couple questions about uh, universal time versus local time, and we did correct for that. So you could uh, submit in either universal or local time, and those were read and put in order. We had a pretty good idea of what time it was just from where you from your GPS data. So um, we weren't going to be eight hours off at the very least. <laughs> time yeah. zones are really hard. So. Yeah, they were. That <laughs> sounded like one of the big issues. <laughs> so Phil kind of asked a question here that, that I think is interesting related to the database. He says, when the full image data sets available, are you going to keep track of which scientific studies are downloading the photos? And if so, uh, are you going to make that information available to project participants? Yeah, so I can answer that. Um, one of the one of the kind of ways that projects such as ours with open data keep track of that exact that exactly that question is by using a reference number to cite the data in their research. Uh, just like when you write a paper, a scientific paper, there's a, a bibliography at the end or what we call a references section at the end where all the past papers that you're referring to who did that did different research, you refer to those. Um, you would also put a reference to the data set, this mega movie data set in there. And we'll be using um, a reference number called a DOI, which I forget what it refers to, uh, but it's a way to ref, it's a library cataloging system number that's used worldwide uh, to track all sorts of um, papers and data sets and such. So we are getting a DOI for this data set. And then we will just simply ask any of the scientists who use this data to please reference that DOI for the data set so we can track who's been using, who does use uh, the data set. Now, since it's CC0 license, they technically don't have to. <laughs> it's free for that, for anyone to use in any way they want. Um, but I, but generally people want to cite where they're getting their information. So they, they will, I I'm pretty confident that most scientists will be citing it. Right. Um, this looks like a question from Jeffrey for Juan. Uh, he's asking, how long is the time lapse of that CME movie? Uh, it's six hours. Oh, wow, well, that's longer than I right, thought. From, from, yeah, so from the start to the end of the movie, it's about six hours. Got it, thanks. And there were a couple of questions about feedback on the images you submitted. Um, we are not going to be able to do that. We got so many images that there is really no way for us to help um, with feedback or um, enhanced copies, Frank was asking about. Um, so you're welcome to make changes in Photoshop and do what you want on your end. Um, I, we will not, those aren't going to be included in the data set. Um, after they've been enhanced, I don't believe. Um, not in the main data set. We'd have to figure out what to do with them if um, people are making them out of many, many images. 
uh, where those should be located. For now, I think they're going to be in the Google group if, you, if you're making those now. Um, we might come up with a better way to do that. So if anyone has great suggestions, let us know. But as far as feedback goes, um, um, I think that uh, maybe just comparing your own images to all the other images you see, you can, you will be able to search by your name um, and find your images from the data set, I believe. Is that right, Calvin? Uh, yes, the, the name will be, everyone's name uh, will be in the, I think, artist field of the, or photographer field of the EXIF data within the, within the photos. Great. Yeah, and one other note on that. Um, if you uh, have your name, uh, if you don't see your name on the mega movie um, video that we made and you think that it should be there, you think that you uploaded the files in time, or if you have your name on there as something you'd rather change it to, if you'd like to change that to something else, uh, please let us know. Just send us an email. Um, you can send it to megamovie at astrosociety.org, and I'll just put that in the comments in one second. Or, uh, Brian, if you would just put megamovie at astrosociety.org, then I'll keep um, going through some questions. Thank and you. One note on that, make sure that you're checking the latest version that is on yes. the Eclipse Mega movie website. Um, we've, we've been adding, we, we've been following the group and seeing uh, people who've said, hey, my name's not in here and making sure that we're either fixing the bug or adding it ourselves. Um, so yeah, make sure that you check the, the latest one. Great, and let us know what name is on there that you would like changed if that's the case. Yeah, um, and, and there were, just to go back to the DOI, I just saw okay. um, uh, high and uh, Alan and Vanessa made some good comments. Uh, DOI is Digital Object Identifier. Thank you very much. And there's a comment, even though it's free, Creative Commons licenses do strongly encourage citing and giving credit. So, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And we will be toting, well, yeah, we'll be reminding people it's a kind thing to do. <laughs> um, Jay was asking if we're interested in any pictures of the sunspots that were on the sun just before C1. Um, or, or is anyone doing any in, uh, science with those that we know of? I don't know of anything. Hugh or Juan, do you know of any? It's a it's an interesting question. Uh, absolutely, sunspots are interesting, but uh, uh, there probably is. Look, how can I say this properly? Spotty coverage of these, of these, <laughs> because many people won't have been taking images before and after. So the database won't be so extensive for that kind of data. But in general, I like sunspots. Sunspots are mysterious and, and remarkable, and we want to learn about them. So I, I won't say never, never say never. So the sunspots are fairly well covered by the satellites. That yeah. But, the, but somebody, but somebody asked about the cadence, what we call the image cadence, uh, in the movie that Juan showed. How frequently were were images being taken? And uh, the satellites, of course, are limited in how frequently they can take images because they it's expensive to get data back and forth. And so uh, the LASCO that takes the chronograph observations, I think it's every twenty or thirty minutes. So they only had two or three images during the entire time, uh, the ninety minute time, which we have fifty thousand images, and so. It's a, it's a diff, it's qualitatively quite different, and the same thing is true of sunspots. The uh, the standard uh, product from uh, the Solar Dynamics Observatory is much better. There, it's every forty five seconds, uh, but uh, in principle, even that is slow by comparison with this massive data we've got from all of you all of you volunteers. Yeah, and we can add that into our discussions of um, incorporating more data. We're, we're trying to figure that out as we go along. Um, and so we'll, in, we'll incorporate the, the sunspot data as another component in our discussions. Um, there's a question from Hai about um, the units on the axis of that filtered image you were showing, Laura. Do you have any idea? If you want to pull that up, you're welcome to. Yeah, let me pull it up. I because I yeah. do know um, what I do know what they're talking about because I saw that. But I'm going to ask Juan to answer. Um, okay, so let me. I have, what happened? Maybe while you're doing that, Hugh, um, there's a question about raw images and if they're going to be used in a different way than uh, other types like JPEG. Yes. Uh, well, Laura. 
uh, mentioned that I think the JPEG is maybe a, a good tool for discovery. Uh, all the images are valuable because each one is unique. Uh, but once you once you found something you want to study objectively and quantitatively, then the, the raw image, especially the raw images with the flats and darks, are the most uh, precise and so yeah they'll be they'll be they'll be, they'll be available and people will for wanting to to burrow down and really get the numbers proper numbers out of a, of a piece of data will want to do that for sure okay, okay oh, here's the yeah what is those units yeah the zero those two. are those are pixel units mm. Okay, so there's 2,000 pixels by 2,000 pixels. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good question. <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, thanks, hi. I, I didn't get that either. Great. Um, so it is the top of the hour again, 7 o'clock um, West Coast time and much, much later on the East Coast. I just want to thank everybody so much for participating in this. It has really been um, one of the highlights of my um, life it has been kind of amazing. It's not that often you get to do brand new science with um, a bunch of new friends. So thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks to the team that's put in all this hard work. Thanks to everybody who has, um, you know, been studying and practicing and taking these images. It was um, the work of a huge, huge group of us. And I just can't thank you all enough. Um, and I can't wait to see the science that comes out of this. So we'll um, keep you posted. There's, we'll post a, another um, list of information in the next day or two um, uh, that has all of this information and more for people who couldn't make the presentation. And, and we'll keep up with the Google group for a little while longer. So, and let me just say yes to 2024. Yeah. <laughs> we, we can't take all this and then not do anything yeah. with it again. So absolutely, we will, we hope you will um, participate again. <laughs> Excellent. And I'll see you guys in the Southern Hemisphere for 2019. <laughs> Thank you. Konnichiwa. Good night.